Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi On behalf of our teacher, our Sheikh, uh, our Imam, Mufti Ghulam Sirin Akshbandi, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to our centre here. Um, just before I start, uh, I think I'm just going to ask, ask the brothers to move a bit closer. The reason being, there are still people who are coming in who need to pray Maghrib. So if you move a bit closer, they can pray on the sides and then people aren't feeling disturbed. And it's more respectful for, for, for Sidi here when he's, when he's going to come here as well. Um, most of you all know Sidi here, I'm sure. Um, and obviously he doesn't uh, need an introduction, but uh, um, just to refresh our mind, Sidi Yahya wrote this, he uh, embraced, sorry, he was born in 1977. Uh, at the age of 19, he embraced Islam and uh, went on to study the deen. He traveled to uh, Mauritania, uh, where he studied um, Arabic, uh, Akida, Fiqh, and Tajweed uh, at the feet of uh, one of uh, uh, one of the greatest scholars, one of the most righteous scholars um, alive today, the great Sheikh of Mauritania, Sheikh Mar Abdul Hajj. May Allah preserve him and grant him and give him a long life. Um, Sidi Yahya refers to his teacher as the one who teaches with his spiritual state and his actions before he teaches with his words. He is a man who um, has completely devoted his life for the attainment of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Sidi Yahya went on, uh, in the past five years he spent uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Yemen with uh, studying the three objectives with um, Sheikh uh, Habib Omar and Habib Ali Jifri. Uh, the three objectives being firstly the studying, uh, study and the study of um, the sacred knowledge the second being the purification of one's heart, and the third being uh, the invitation to Allah, to, to the deen. Um, he's also been studying other sciences such as uh, hadith, uh, tafsir, uh, sira, Arabic poetry, and, and so on. Uh, Sidi Yahya likes to keep his talks relevant to the people. Um, and, this, and, the, and the topic he's chosen um, today is uh, the topic of hope, fear, and repentance, inshallah. So after the talk, inshallah, there'll be some time for, for questions. Uh, and if brothers want, would like to write the questions down, and the sisters in the other hall, if they would like to write the questions down as well, there'll be time for that, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana inna kanta al-alim al-hakeem wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-azim Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having gathered us here tonight people that are from different places throughout the earth and it is the light of Islam in testimony and declaration of faith which gathers here tonight that each and every single one of us bears witness that there is no God but Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah the greatest messenger of Allah and the last prophet sent to mankind and the last guidance to all of mankind until Yom Qiyamah and if we look around, we find ourselves in a place that was months ago, or perhaps a few years ago, uh, originally a church. That originally there was types of worship that was taking place in this uh, building that we're now in, that is not in correspondence to what the Messenger of Allah has brought. But now from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has now become a masjid is become a place where people prostrate and declare that there is only God, there is only one God. And we take a meaning from this. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it permissible in sacred law
for a church to change into a mosque. This is indicating to us the reality of our deen. Because the very mosque of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was built upon a graveyard where the bodies of polytheists were buried. Right? The mosque of the Messenger of Allah was built upon a place that would outwardly be a type of place that people would normally leave. Right? But it's the idea that even within the different types of water that we have when we study the different chapters of fiqh, right? There's water that's pure in and of itself, but there's also water that is purifying, right? And so not only is Islam pure in and of its essence, but it also is purifying. That Medina was a place where there was a plague before the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had traveled there. But once he had made dua for this plague to be removed, to be moved to a different city, it became Taiba. One of the names of Medina is Taiba, right? The pure city. Right? The title that we normally refer to Medina uh, today, Al Medina al Monawara. Right? Al Medina al Monawara, who was the one that brought light to Medina? It was the Messenger of Allah. So Medina was given light because of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Being in there Being in this vicinity And this became a, a, a center For everything to come after it Was with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So we thank him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala That he has given us This great deen He's given us this great deen That still someone In this time Can become close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because of what the Messenger of Allah has left behind us. We see in one of his statements, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, تُرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْمَحَجَّةِ الْبَيْضَاءِ That I have left you upon the straight, clear, white path. Right? A clear path. He's left us upon a clear path. لَيْلَهَا كَنَّهَارِهَا It's night. is like day. لَا يَزِقْ عَنْهَا إِلَّا حَالِكْ That the only person that will fall, will go astray from this path, is someone that he himself has destroyed. Right? In another hadith, لا يحلك على الله إلا حالك That the only person that will truly be destroyed is someone that, 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 that chooses. Right? That is just chooses not to follow the guidance of the Messenger of Allah. So we have something, we have a way of getting close to the Messenger of Allah, getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of the Messenger of Allah that is completely preserved until this day. There is people alive today that are continually uh, rising in their spiritual rank. And this is what we wanted to talk about today, about this path that a human being takes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this inward path that he takes. Right? Of the most important things of these paths are those that were mentioned in the title, those of being hope, those of being fear, and that of repentance. And so, that when we've been given this deen that contains three basic integrals that of iman which is belief that of islam which is the outward form of how we worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we've also been given ihsan the inward science of how we, our journey to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the inward how an individual perfects his sincerity of worship because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Qur'an, وَمَا أُمِرُوا They have not been ordered, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ They've only been ordered to be sincere, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sincerity, only for His, only for his sake. So if an individual wants to attain this sincerity, how does he perfect his sincerity? Right. How does he attain these states of the heart? And this is what the inward science of Ihsan is all about. There is a methodology for a human being to attain these various states of the heart. To attain these various stages that one goes through. And if we look, that there's ways of doing so. One of the very greatest ways to incite one to set out to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by being in the gatherings of the scholars. And being in the gatherings of the righteous people. Because when you are with righteous people, 
that you find that they would draw from you the great aspects of yourself. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't tell us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu attaqullaha wa kunu ma'asadiqeen. That He didn't tell us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be from the sadiq. Right? He didn't tell us to be from the sincere. Right? From His mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us to be with the sincere. And the nature of being with people that are sincere is that their sincerity will pass on to those that are with them. Right? This is one of the secrets of our tradition is when you sit before people who have mastered the tradition inwardly and outwardly, that just by sitting in front of them and just by seeing them, that what is in their heart right, goes on to, to what is in your heart. Because whenever two people sit, that their hearts are taken from one another without them any, even realizing it. And the simple example they give is that we have two eyes. We have an inward eye and a physical eye. In the physical eye, with the slightest bit of dust to get into the physical eye, that our eyes will start to water and none of us will be able to see. The smallest particle, let alone something big. So what about our spiritual eye then, of our heart? That occasionally we think that we go through life and think that that's what is around us is not affecting us. But every single day, from the beginning of our day until the end of day, is having an effect upon our spiritual heart, or in other words, our reality of our spiritual state. Right? So what these limbs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, where are we putting them? What are we allowing to come into our heart? Because the heart is the most precious thing of an individual. It is the most precious thing that an individual has, is his heart. And actions of the heart are greater than actions of the limbs. That this thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us called the qalb, right? It's called, it's called the qalb because of it's so quick to, uh, to, uh, to constantly be changing, right? That, 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 that there's a hadith that states that the heart of an individual is between the two fingers of the all-merciful, right? In a way that is appropriate to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he moves it however he wants. The heart is constantly in a different state. That there's certain things that come to the heart that a person has to be patient. There's certain things that come to the individual where the person has to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's certain things that come to the individual where he has to have uh, trust in Allah. And so it's, in, it's, it's extremely important that we study the state of our heart. The state of our heart, how our heart is with our Lord. And this is what the inward path of setting out on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all about, it's all based upon the individual's heart. If we look at the meanings of what tasawwuf means, what it means to purify the heart, it's all based upon, and revolves around the access of, access of attaining sincerity. It's all based upon this, of how do we attain sincerity. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, قَلْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا he has surely indeed succeeded who has purified it. What is he referring to, subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? He's referring to the heart of the individual. He's referring to the state of one with his Lord. And this is something that the previous people, their focus was upon this. Their focus was on how to attain the sincerity. And so when you sit before a scholar of the likeness of Marabat al-Hajj, or the likeness of, of many of the modern day scholars. That there's a secret that passes by from the person speaking to the student without him even realizing it. Right? That there's something going on in the inward. Right? Because when we look at the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that outwardly he was a human being. Right? But inwardly, that he was full of light, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that anyone that would sit with him, that they would immediately become enlightened. This is why we see someone who's even the youngest of people, who at least met with the Messenger of Allah, even if they were two years old. They're considered to be a Sahabi. They're considered to be a companion. Right? Because they say of the power, of the light of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would pierce everyone that was in front of them. And this manifested 
in the lives of the Sahaba after this. That we see Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, who when he passed away, radiallahu anhu, that the throne of Allah, of the All-Merciful, shook for him. <laughs> the throne shook for him because of the greatness of his maqam and of his rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at one of his statements is, is that he said that never, since the time have I become Muslim, have I never prayed a prayer except that I had full concentration in that prayer. I had full presence of mind or presence of heart in that prayer. Now many of us now know that we want to have presence of mind in our prayers. And a lot of us are struggling to, in order to have presence of mind in our prayers. So how could it be that from the day one that he became Muslim, that his heart was completely present in his prayer? Right? This is because they were the Sahaba. They saw the Messenger of Allah. And the light of prophethood penetrated their uttermost being. Right? So that they were able to go on and do what they were able to do. Right? But it was all from this meeting that they had with the Messenger of Allah. Right? And this is the best way for us to start upon taking a path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting ourselves with good people. If we put ourselves with good people, we will find things come from us in their gatherings that we don't find in the gatherings of heedlessness. We'll find certain himmas come to our heart of wanting to do such and such a thing, wanting to do such and such a thing, wanting to be like such and such. Right? And this is one of the ways by which we rise, raise our himma and raise our spiritual aspirations is by sitting with the people of Allah. And the first step that causes one or incites one or urges one to set out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what's called a ba'ath is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts something in the heart of that individual such that he says that I want to get close to my Lord right and this is after the blessing of iman the greatest blessing that an individual can have that he feels in his heart this urge to get close to his Lord and people who don't find this urge, it's upon them to put themselves in situations so that they can get this urge. And then after people get this urge, that there's a way for them to protect this urge that they've been given. And so if someone does not find this urge in his heart, this urge and this constant, uh, almost like a disturbance in his heart of wanting to get close to his Lord, then how do we attain this? One way was what we previously mentioned about being with the people of Allah. And Salat al Jumu'ah was not named Salat al Jumu'ah except because this is where people join and this is where people gather together. The point of Salat al Jumu'ah is for us to become aware. The point of Salat al Jumu'ah is not to just hasten and pray and listen to it and to just go quickly. The point of Salat al Jumu'ah is to come to the prayer and remind oneself of Allah. To remind oneself that he has to be a person of taqwa. To remind oneself that he has to be a person who dedicates his life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Salat al Jumu'ah is all about. It's about reminding. Right? This is what the prayer is all about. The prayer is about reminding. This is why that the Prophet Muhammad has left us with du'as for every instance. Almost everything. For if we see the sun, if we see the moon, when the first rain... There's all du'as for everything that we do. And this is in order to remind us about what our purpose is upon life. What our purpose is of life. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us for any benefit that He's going to get from us. He's created us subhanahu wa ta'ala because He wants to give us something. Right? He's created us subhanahu wa ta'ala because He wants us to come to know Him. And this is what bin Adam has been given. That no one else has been given. And this is why he's been preferred over everyone else. He's been preferred over everyone else is because of his ability to know Allah. It's because of his ability to come to know the creator of the heavens and the earth. And this is what should push one to live. This is what one should desire for every single day is to increase in getting closer to his Lord, to increase in knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
to increase in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us incumbent for us to know. And thus by knowing this and following this, thus getting close to our Lord. And so this urge that comes to one, that incites one to set out, that incites one to want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that once one has this, that he has to realize the jewel that he's been given. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him with it and he didn't bless other people with it? This is something from his will subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if one feels this in their heart, they have to realize the greatness of what they've been given. That after the blessing of Islam, there's nothing greater than this. And then he has to preserve it. And how does he preserve it? That normally if we come to a gathering of khair, that we leave the gathering excited. We leave the gathering with himma. We leave the gathering of wanting to change aspects of our lives. Right? And then a few days might go by and we might lose the effects of that gathering. Or even maybe that same night we might go spend some time and start uh, doing certain things such that we lose entirely the barakah of that gathering. So how can we attain? How can we uh, attain and keep that which we attain from the gatherings that are, 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 are supposed to to join our hearts and put our hearts in a state of wanting to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that's extremely important for us. In this time that we live in a time that people are going to all different types of gatherings, that we have to establish gatherings on a weekly basis, right? On a bi-weekly basis, on a monthly basis, a gathering where people gather together and they do something, whether it be recite the burda, whether it be recite, whether it be to study between them, that these are the gatherings by which we have, we have to establish these gatherings between us. Because it is a means for the preservation of our iman. It is a means for the preservation of our spiritual state. And so when a person sets out and feels this urge and has a desire to get close to his Lord, then he has to be concerned to, pro- to preserve it. He has to watch those people that he hangs around with. He has to watch the various things that are going to try to come to his heart. Because once he's been given this most precious thing, be for sure that the shaitan and the, de- and the devils are going to try to come take this from him. They're going to try in every way that they can to come in and take this jewel that this person is going to be, that he's going to be given. Right? He's going to try to come to him from all different ways. And so our gatherings have to be gatherings that people become elevated, right? That this was the way that the gathering of the Messenger of Allah was and those that came after them from the righteous people. We have some of the righteous people used to say, whenever my himma would become low, that I would just go look at Muhammad ibn Wasi', one of the Salihin, and he said that I would be able to have more himma for weeks on end because of having, just by, just by looking at this man. Right? And anyone who sat with the people of Allah, they will find this. That the human being is weak, the human being uh, falls short, the human being uh, falls into certain situations, right? And this is why the people that are the people of remembrance, the people that if you see them, that they remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's why they have such a great rank with Allah, right? Is the fact that they are close to Allah in and of themselves, and they are means for people to get close to Allah. And I'm glad the brother Imran had mentioned the three objectives. Because this is something that is critical in our lives for us to understand. This is something that a modern day scholar has termed the three objectives, but they aren't in reality except a summation of the various types of ibadah of those that were living in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those are the three objectives being one, seeking sacred knowledge. Two, concern of purifying one's heart. And three, that one take out what he's learned and take it out to the people and teach the people. That if you look to the various actions that took place in the life of the Messenger of Allah, that they were in one of these three categories. Right? And this was their life. That there was times that they were focusing upon knowledge. There was times that they were focusing upon their spiritual state. And there were times that they were focusing upon calling people to Allah. And if you didn't think that these people were of spiritual state, then how do you explain that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was talking to Sayyidina Umar, and Sayyidina Umar had told him that, O Messenger of Allah, 
that you are more beloved to me than my money and my children, except my soul that is between my two sides. And the Messenger of Allah said, Omar, that none of you will truly believe until I am more beloved to him even than his soul that is between his two sides. And they say that Sayyidina Omar had paused. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, you are more beloved to me. Now you are more beloved to me, even to my soul that is between my two sides. Right. And this is when the Messenger of Allah said to him, he said, now your faith has become complete, O Omar. But the point is, what was going on with Sayyidina Omar in those moments? Right? That he was, he, he, they say about this, they say that this is taraki, that this is a rising in rank of Sayyidina Omar by the barakah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa That this was a means for him to rise in rank. And so he was an inward person. He had the ability to, to, to overcome certain things in his heart and it was a means for him to rise. And so these three objectives are the ladder by which we get close to our Lord. Is that our life should be spread about these three different things is that we should have a portion of all three, right? That, كُلُّكُمْ رَعِنْ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْعُولٌ عَنْ رَيَّتِهِ That the Prophet ﷺ said that all of you are shepherds, all of you are responsible. And everyone is responsible for his flock, or those people that he's responsible for. And that everyone has certain people that they can talk to. Some people have friends, other people have brothers, other people have wives, other people have uh, children. Everyone has certain people that he is responsible for. And we're going to be asked about these various people that are we responsible for. That how did we interact with them? Right? It was our concern, did we share a concern with them about a concern for the next world? Because don't think that non-Muslims all throughout the earth, that all of them have concern for their children just like Muslims have concern for their children. All of them want them to be healthy. All of them want them to have a good education. All of them want them to be safe. Right? But if this is the case, then what is the difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim? Right? There has to be a difference. The difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim is that what's most important to him is, is Akhirah, is the next world. This is how we differentiate ourselves from the disbelievers. Is that we put forth our non-worldly and our true life concerns over the basic concerns. And that doesn't mean we're not concerned with the basic concerns. But there has to be something to distinguish. What is the difference between us and difference between the people who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these three maqasid are the way by which we set out to Allah. These three maqasid are the way by which we implement and establish the various outward actions with hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the ruh of those actions. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to establish outward actions and our hope is that eventually by establishing those, that then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put in the ruh of those actions such that we feel the sweetness of ibadah. Right? And this is the three stages of the soul. That first, that doing acts of ibadah are difficult for the soul. Right? This is why we have to overcome our soul and eventually that our soul will submit. But there's a higher level than this that eventually that the acts of ibadah will become pleasing to the individual. That they'll actually, the pleasure will be in that particular type of ibadah. This is why the Messenger of Allah said, الصلاح, That the coolness of my eyes was in prayer. He used to say to Sayyidina Bilal, Arihna biha ya Bilal, that bring us repose by it, by the prayer. O Bilal. Right? That what a different state between two individuals that someone when the adhan goes off, that he's worried about having to get up and make wudu because it's cold. Right? Or between an individual who as soon as he hears the adhan, he remembers Allah and a, a, a longing for his Lord comes forth and he thanks Allah that he's given him another opportunity to worship him. Right? What a difference it is between the two. And there's a hadith where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, that, إِنَّ لِي رَبِّكُمْ فِي أَيَّامِ دَهْرِكُمْ لَنَفَحَاتِ That verily your Lord in the days of your time has these nafahat, these nafahat, these spiritual breezes. Right? 
Right? So expose yourself to them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has these nafahat. Right? He has these spiritual breezes that He gives certain individuals. Right? That why is it that some people just hear a speech of one particular individual, all of a sudden he makes tawbah and sets out on a path to Allah. Right? right? What's upon us is, to, is to, go, to fulfill the order of the Messenger of Allah. The order of the Messenger of Allah is to expose ourselves. And if we expose ourselves, perhaps it is that in that very moment will be the moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us one of these spiritual breezes. Right? It could perhaps be a spiritual breeze that rises us to an extremely high rank in one short period of time. So if we outwardly implement, right? If we outwardly implement the actions and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made and coming upon us, then we will then find a pleasure. A pleasure will eventually come. And such that that form of worship will be more beloved to us than any other thing. Right. Then that we no longer want to even be with people. That one time when Sayyidina Umar bin al-Khattab, when he was Khalifa, that there was someone who was always with Sayyidina Umar. Right? He said he was just always with Sayyidina Umar. Sayyidina Umar looked at him. He said that, did, are, are you just, did you just make this hijrah to be with Umar? Right? He's going to, I'm going to call you Muhajir Umar. Right? The person who just made hijrah to be with Umar. Right? And the person took a meaning from that. Sayyidina Umar was giving him advice. Right? He said the person had realized that maybe he wasn't doing what he should have been doing. And so he became a person of ibadah. And they said that he became, ibadah had, come, had become so beloved to this person that he was rarely ever seen. Right? And then he came back to Sayyidina Umar. And Umar had, had not seen him in a long period of time. And he said, that, where have you been? He said that I've, I've found that the ibadah of Allah is better than Umar. <laughs> I found that worshipping my Lord is sweeter and more pleasurable than being with Umar. Right? He's, in the, he's with Allah. Right? He, was, he was worshipping his Lord. Right? He was, there's a sweetness to the, this munaja, this intimate uh, conversation. This intimate spiritual discourse that someone can have with their Lord. Right? And this is why they say that anyone who claims that they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the night falls and the night comes and they just go to sleep, they said that they've lied in their claim of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because anyone who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will stand when everyone else goes to sleep and when everyone else gets themselves comfortable with their comforter and their bed and their feather pillow, right? It's very difficult for... But if someone loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will get up and stand before their Lord. Because this is the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This is a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has... brings special things to the hearts of His awliya. To the hearts of those who He wants. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... It's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you if He wakes you up in this time. This last third of the night... That it's called out. That is there anyone who's making tawbah such that I may forgive them? If there anyone who's asking for a need such that I may give them their need? Is there anyone asking me for something such that I may help them in it? Right? This is a time that we complain about our state. We complain about the state of the Muslims. When was the last time that any of us stood during this time? When was the last time that we took advantage of this special time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that someone calls out, is there anyone seeking tawbah that I may forgive them? Or seeking a need that I may give them what they need? That if we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this time, and we seek out these special times that He's given us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will see the change in our own selves. We will see the change in those that are around us. Right? That the people of Allah, when anything happens to them, the first thing they do is turn to Allah. The very first thing they do is turn to Allah. Before they turn to people, that they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it be a family problem, whether it be a personal problem, whether it be anything that they have, right? Whether they're in a depressed state, right? We know the state of our, this is, the, this is an indication of the state of our heart, right? There's very simple tests, right? Analysis that we can give our heart to find out the state of our heart. What is the state of our heart when we come upon a tribulation? Are we just complain and turn to, our, turn to people? Right? Or do we first take our problems to, 
the Creator, who didn't give us these problems, except that He wants us to turn to Him. That we have to see, if we witness the problem being from Allah, that we witness that He only wants us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to turn to Him. And this is why it has come to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people He loves, that He will postpone for them that which they truly want. Because He loves to hear His servant in a state of tadarra, in a state of constantly turning to Him. Right? And this is the state of a believer. Is that he's, a st- he's, in a, he's in a lowly state. He's in a humble state. He's in a state of constantly desiring the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because one of his names is Al-Jawad. Right? One of his names is the generous. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to be generous at any moment, then who's going to stop the generosity of Allah? Right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to descend, have mercy descend upon this gathering right here, who's going, to, who's going to stop the mercy of Allah? Who's going to stop the generosity of Allah? And this is why in every moment we have to be waiting for the generosity of Allah. We have to be expecting the generosity of Allah. That in any moment, this, this generosity could come. And that's why they say you should never belittle any good action. Because you never know where the contentment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be. It could be in any little thing. Right? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven someone, a lady who was a... a, 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 a a prostitute because she gave a, a dog to drink from her shoe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven her all of her sins. And we know at the same time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had punished a woman because she refused, she had a cat that she didn't feed and refused to let it eat from that which grew on the, uh, on the earth. And so we don't know where the anger or the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lies. And so this is why we have to have this ta'arud. We have to expose ourselves to these spiritual breezes. We have to expose ourselves and put ourselves in situations hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring us to life and put this spiritual breeze and bless us to feel the reality of this ibadah and experience the pleasure of ibadah. Right? We need to have, this is what's called lok. We need to have experience the sweetness of Islam. Right? The Sahabi that, 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 that was eating dates And the Messenger of Allah had told them That Jannah had lied underneath the, the shade of, uh, of swords That he looked at the Messenger of Allah And he said, is this true, O Rasulullah? And he said, yes And he was eating some dates He threw his dates down He said, that if that's the case Then the life that I'm going to live is a, is a, is a, is a long life to attain this Right? And he went on immediately and went into the battle. Right? And one of the other Sahabis was with him, Sayyidina Sa'ad bin Mu'ad. And he told them, he said, that, I smell Jannah. I smell Jannah. Right? And, he, and they said that he, he went off and fought in the battle until that he was eventually killed. And he said he had over 80 wounds in his body. Right? But he smelled Jannah. Right? He smelled the scent of paradise. Halas, what else do you want? Halas. Halas. Right? You smell the sin of paradise. Right? What, is this, what is this world about except to attain this paradise? Except to attain the, the mercy and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And this is the only person who's going to wish to come back into the world. They're going to, a shaheed wishes to come back into the world and hopes that he gets the chance to die like that a second time. Right? Because of the greatness of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for the martyrs. Who have given their, who have given up their etern- their physical lives, and their lives that come to an end for their eternal lives, right? And if someone is sincere, if someone is sincere, they'll attain a shahada, they'll attain a shahada martyrdom, even if it be on their bed. Right? This is not something that is far fetched. This is something that is near. Right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants good for us. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to set out to a path of on to Him. And if we set out even in the smallest way to Allah, right? When taqarrab ilayya shibran, taqarrab to ilayhi ba'an, that whoever draws near to me a hand span distance, I will come to him the distance of if a person spreads out his arms, right? 
And that man that whoever comes to me walking, then I will come to him running. That the idea here is that if we set out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He'll open His doors of mercy for us. Right? Just a little effort from us, and He'll put barakah in that mercy. And He'll put barakah in that which we do. And take us, and take us distances out which we can't take and attain by ourselves. And so the spiritual path is this path of a person desiring closest to his Lord. Right? That the world was not created except because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had loved to shower his blessings upon this earth. We see in the hadith, although some of the uh, scholars of hadith have said, uh, have talked about the authenticity of the narration, but the people of Allah talk about the validity of the meaning. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I was a hidden treasure. فَأَحْبَبْتُ an أَعْرَفْ I love to become known. So I created the creation in order that they may know me. So the basis of creation is love. And then we see in another hadith, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu says, that he says that the person will continue to do super agatory acts. لا يزال عبدي يتكرب إلي بالنوافل that the servant will continue to draw nearer to me with super agatory acts حتى أحب until I love him so it's the origin of creation and it's the end of creation it's the end and the ultimate thing that a human being attains is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's the beginning of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أحببتو نعرف I love to be known. Hatta ahibba until that I may love him. Right? And this is the ultimate thing that a human being will attain is the mercy of Allah. Is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at his name subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al Rahman, that love is the essence of mercy. Right? And so when we talk about the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praying upon him. In the ayah in the Quran where he were, when he where that was mentioned by the Mufti, right? In the Allah wa Malaikatuhu Yusalluna al Nabi. Yusalluna is in the present tense. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praying upon the Messenger of Allah and will be praying upon the Messenger of Allah until eternity. Right? And so the prayer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Messenger of Allah is Rahmah. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showering rahmah upon the heart of the Messenger of Allah in every single second that goes on until eternity. Right? And each second is greater than the first. And each second is greater and greater and greater until there's no ending. Right? Until no ending. These things are incapable of a human being understanding the greatness of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for the believers. Who we only have a short period of time, very, very short period of time. Even the lo- one who lives the longest from us, right? It's a very short period of time. But this is an opportunity for us to make our entire life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to get close to Him. And this is our, this is our ras and mad. This is our capital that we have, right? In, 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 if a businessman that according to his, the, the capital that he has will be to the according... To the, the, the ability that he can invest and enter into buying and trading. Well, this is our capital. The capital of the student of knowledge is his time. This is what we've been given. We have an opportunity to spend this time for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the test is all about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the greatness of what someone can reach. He tells us that of this, this, this state that they can reach and closeness to him. And so these type of things should encourage us to set out onto the path. They should encourage us to desire to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this brings us to what was asked to be talked about tonight. Right? This is an introduction to talk about this repentance and hope and fear. That once someone now has had this bath and this urge to set out to Allah, the very first step, that they have to, that the very first step that they have to take is to make, to seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the very first step. That they say that for seeking forgiveness has a beginning and it never has an ending. That there has, we have to make a sincere toba in this moment from everything that preceded. And it never will have an ending. Because that once we make toba from 
anything that would take us outside of the fold of Islam, anything that would be kufr or anything that would be ridda, then we have to make tawbah from the kabair, from the major wrong actions. Then we have to make tawbah from the sagayr, from the lesser wrong actions. And no wrong action is small. And then we have to make tawbah from the makruhat, from the dislike things. Then we have to make tawbah from the bad etiquettes that we have. And then if we've done this, then we make tawbah from the dubious matters that we've fallen into, the shubahat. And if we've done this, then we can make tawbah from our state of heedlessness that we've fallen into. And then, that if we make tawbah from all of these things, right? We don't do anything that takes us outside of the fold of Islam. We don't do any wrong action. We don't do anything that's disliked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't do anything that's even bad adab, right? That if we're in a state where we don't fall out of the divine presence, we're constantly uh, present with our Lord, right? Then we have to make tawbah for the fact that we can never truly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He deserves to be worshipped. And that was the tawbah of the Messenger of Allah. Because the Messenger of Allah used to make istighfar constantly. Some of them say a hundred times a day. Others used to say a hundred times in one gathering. Seventy to a hundred times in one gathering. They would hear the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of creation. His name is Ahmed, the one who praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most. His name is Hamid, the one who is praising Allah. His name is Mahmud, the one who is praiseworthy. But despite this, he makes istighfar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to this extent. Constantly making istighfar. Because he realized he's ultimately unable to worship his Lord as he deserves to be worshipped. Well, what a, what a great rank this is. Right? And this is, this is why they say the Hasanat al-Abrar Sayyat al That the good deeds of the righteous right, are the bad deeds of those who are closest to Allah. Right? And what does this mean? It means that, for instance, let's say that someone has a, a, a loaf of bread that this is what the scholars mentioned to bring it close to our minds to understand. If someone has a loaf of bread and they wanted to give it away in charity, that if a person is righteous, he might give half of it away. Right? Whereas the person who's muqarrab, who's drawn near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this would actually, if he didn't give away everything he had, right, in his, in his right, because of his spiritual state, it would be as if he did something wrong because he left the other half. Right? So if he didn't give away all of it, Right? This is what we see in the life. This, is, this, is, this, this was the rank of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. When Sayyidina Umar had brought half of his wealth, Sayyidina, Umar, Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq brought a hundred percent of his wealth. A hundred percent. Gave it all. Left nothing. Not left nothing. Left the greatest what he could leave. Because when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, what did you leave for your family? He had said that I left him Allah and his Messenger. Right? Complete trust in Allah. Complete trust in Allah. That he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him that which he wanted. And so these are the different states. And the, all of the sahaba are great. But some of them greater than others. He is a Siddiq. Right? He is, the, he is a Siddiq. He is the, the companion of, Allah, of, of the Messenger of Allah. Where the Imam of Abu Bakr to be put in one side of the scales and the Imam of the entire Ummah on the other side. That the Imam of Abu Bakr would have outweighed him. This was the state of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. Right? He's been given many khususiyat and special things of his closeness to the Messenger of Allah. Right? Because of the, his, 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 his way that he had, had, had strived and sought for the deen. And so, the first stage is the stage of tawbah. Is that a person make a sincere repentance. To never again return to anything that he previously did. And that tawbah has three conditions. One, that if he be doing that type of action, that he stop doing it. Two, that he have remorse. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, النَّدَمُ tawba That remorse is tawbah. Three, is that he have a firm intention in his heart to never again return to that thing that he did. He have firm intention to never again return to that thing. And then if these conditions are fulfilled, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. And so he makes tawbah from every thing that proceeded, and then he sets out to his Lord. And then he sets out, and he, makes, he, he does the beginning, and then the tawbah, as was previously mentioned, never has an end. And this leads us then to hope and fear. Right? This leads us to hoping for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and fearing 
the punishment of Allah. These are the two wings by which the believer strives and gets close to his Lord. At times, we have to have hope. And at times, we have to have fear. At times, we have to desire and bring to our heart the greatness of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We have to read a hadith that talk about where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that my slave, as long as he hopes in me, and as long as he calls upon me, I will forgive him everything he's done. Wala ubali. Right? And I don't care. Were the sins of my slave to become to fill the heavens from the from the earth into the heavens, would they all become uh, filled with sins? But my slave comes to me sincerely, then I would forgive him. So these are the things we have to withdraw these emotions of the heart. We have to spend time of of, of thinking about these type of things. And, and, and if someone's speaking in, in Juma that, or in any type of talk, these things we might have heard before. But part of being, the barakah of being in the talk and listening to someone speak is that it's an opportunity for these things to become a reality in the heart of a human being. Right? Then whenever we hear about the mercy of Allah, that what actually comes to our heart is that this longing and that this hope in the mercy of Allah then we hear about things that are supposed to make us fear that we have this feeling come to the heart right and not just be this dryness of the heart right we have to have our hearts come to life right we have to have our hearts come to life and feel these situations because the life of the sahaba was filled with these right sometimes say no woman al khattab would recite various ayat from the Qur'an and he would pass out from the fear of Allah. Right? He would pass out from the fear of Allah and people would come and visit him. They would come and visit him on his, in, at his house right? as if he had become sick because he had passed out from this intense fear of, the, of, 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 of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And, and likewise, and they had times of intense hope. Then times where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gave them a basharat that they're from the people of Jannah. Right? And so this is what they this is these two things that they went through. They went through times of hope, and they went through times of fear, and they went through times of hope, and they went through times of fear. Right? Until they come upon their deathbed. Once we reach a stage where we're getting close to returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this should only be for hope. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am in the opinion of my servant, and we have to have a good opinion of Allah. That despite what we've done, we have to have a good opinion of Allah, that He's going to forgive us for everything that took place. And we see the story of Sayyidina Bilal, when he was on his deathbed. And Sayyidina Bilal was very clear, his state with his Lord. It was very clear what had overtaken his heart. That he was one of the Sahaba, that after the death of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he was unable to stay in Medina. He had missed the Messenger of Allah so much that he was unable to stay in Medina because of the departing of the Messenger of Allah. He had gone to Syria. And then he had seen in his dreams, the Messenger of Allah came to him in his dreams. He said, Ma had jafa, ya Bilal? Then what is this dryness that you showed me, O Bilal? Right? And this is when he hastened to come to visit the Messenger of Allah, to visit the grave of the Messenger of Allah. Not just the masjid, the grave of the Messenger of Allah. Right? And he threw himself upon the grave. Right? And after this, that some of the Sahaba had come to him to ask him to give the Adhan. The Sayyidina Abu Bakr and then Omar and others had come to him and asked him to give the Adhan as if he, as, like he had given the Adhan in the time of the Messenger of Allah. And he refused to do it. He said he couldn't do it. Until the grandson the two grandsons of the Messenger of Allah, they hanatay, right? The pleasures, the pleasure of the Messenger of Allah, the sweetness of the Messenger of Allah, Hassan wa Hussein, had asked Bilal, he said that I couldn't refuse the grandsons of the Messenger of Allah. And so that he gave the adhan. And when he gave the adhan, they said as soon as he said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that it, people were just, they were just blown away, Right? That it reminded them so much of the mess time of the Messenger of Allah that they eventually came out into the streets. Right? As soon as he said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, people from Medina walked out into the streets. They thought that the Messenger of Allah had come back to life again. Right? And when he said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, a second time, he said that people just burst out into tears. Right? 
because it reminded them of the time of the Messenger of Allah. Right? It reminded them of how the time was when the most, the best of creation was amongst them. Right? And so Sayyidina Bilal, that this was, his, this was his state. And when he became near to death, that uh, he was on his deathbed and going through the death pangs, that his wife had said to him, his wife had called out, she said, oh, what a horrible situation this is. Right? His wife was in a state of distress. Oh, what a distressful situation this is. Right? And Sayyidina Bilal is on his, he's in, on his deathbed. He's about to return to Allah. Right? And Sayyidina Bilal heard her. And he looked at her and he said, that what a wonderful situation this is. Right? He said, what a, what a happy situation this is. He said, tomorrow I'm going to meet the Prophet and his companions. Right? That's all his concern was. He said, what a, she was looking at it from the fact I'm going to lose my husband and so forth. Right? But Bilal was looking at it, tomorrow I get to meet with Muhammad sallallahu With Sayyidina Muhammad. With the Messenger of Allah. And his companions. Right? This was what they wanted. They just wanted to be with the Messenger of Allah. And so when the death approaches someone, is that these are the meanings that we hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring to our heart. But a person dies according to how he lived. Right? A person dies according to how he lived. If he lived his life in giving victory to the deen of the Messenger of Allah. If he re- lived his life implementing the sunnah. If he lived his life longing to be with the Messenger of Allah. If he lived his life praying constantly upon the Messenger of Allah. If he lived his life having exaltation for the Messenger of Allah, that this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause him to die. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring to his heart right before his death. And this is what's the most important time. And everything leads up to this time of when we ultimately return back to our Lord. And being in a gathering like this of knowledge, which the Prophet Muhammad declared is a rawdah, is a garden from the gardens of paradise. This is one of the greatest ways by which we can meet him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is by bringing to life his sunnah, bringing to life that which he had brought to life, right? And this is what is upon us. Allah subhanahu wa taala has blessed this community with a place like this, and Allah subhanahu wa taala has blessed there to be an interaction with the mufti and the youth. This is a unique situation. Other, many people are not blessed to have a situation like this. Right? People have a, a unique situation. That they have an opportunity to make something of it. Right? They have an opportunity to make big things of it. We should have high himma. Right? We should set our sights really high. We should, we, we should want this to be a center of Islam. Right? We should make intentions that thousands of scholars are made from this school. We should make intentions that millions of people become Muslim by means of this place. And don't think these things are far-fetched. Right? They might seem far-fetched. Right? They might seem like, oh, he's just, he's just talking. Right? But this is, we have to have high himma. Right? And at the same time, begin going step by step and putting in all of our efforts. And this is an opportunity for people here to come together as a community. And everyone has something to offer. Some of them can support it financially. Other people can give a type of effort. Other people can give a type of service. Other people can teach, right? Other people can watch children. Everyone has something to offer, right? Everything has something to offer. And they say that there's nothing that brings happiness to the heart of the Messenger of Allah more than da'wah in Allah, than calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if it weren't for da'wah, that none of us would be sitting here right now. 1426, after, years after the life of the Messenger of Allah, it was only because of the sacrifice of those early people that we're getting to enjoy Islam now in Huddersfield, England. Right? And this is what the, because of the struggles of the early people. But it's not enough for us just to be content with what they struggled. We have to give a part and give what we're able to give. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to be a gathering of mercy and a gathering of rahmah and a gathering that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers our hearts and bless us to act upon one heart and such that we give everything that we have to offer to the sake to the service of the deen of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa sallallahu alaihi wa sallam wa sahbihi wa sallam wa